I'm Fran Burwell. I'm one of the vice presidents here at the Atlantic Council. Welcome back to our conference on Europe Whole and Free. Um, I wanted to first say a couple of housekeeping notes. This session is on the record. And also, if you are tweeting, please use hashtag EWF2014. Hashtag EWF2014. Yesterday and today, we have been looking back at some of the key events in the reconstruction and enlargement of Europe and the building of the transatlantic partnership. We are also looking forward to the challenges we face both now and in the future. We have a stellar program for you today. And to kick us off and introduce the first speaker, it's my great pleasure to call to the podium the European Union Ambassador to the United States, Joao Val Dabeda. Well, good morning. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Fran. Thank you, Fred, Governor, uh, for the exceptional work done by the Atlantic Council in favor of transatlantic relations. It's, uh, it's been a great cooperation. Thank you for this successful uh, conference. Uh, so I thank you for that. But I'm not sure I will thank you for inviting me to do what you asked me to do here today. Because having worked uh, five intense years with Zeman Albarroz, and him being one of the leaders I represent here in Washington, it's not an easy task. If I'm too nice, you will not believe me. If I'm not nice enough, I will have other kinds of problems. <laughs> so uh, it's not the easiest of tasks, but I think I can provide you, in particular to our American friends, a few insights into, into the president of the European Commission. Three, three points. The first one. Uh, his job is a tough one. It's also an important one. I may dare to say that it is the toughest job in Europe. It's more daring to say it's the most important one. But it's certainly a, an extremely difficult one. I mean, his main job, like any president of the Commission, is to keep the Union united. That's the theme of our debate today. Keep the Union united. Very. Uh, different member states, different geographic locations, different histories, sometimes conflicting histories. But we, we decided to be together. Someone has to contribute particularly to that unity. Take the enlargement. Uh, union started with six countries. We are now 28. In 2004, 10 new countries. Seven, another two. Recently, uh, Croatia. Uh, Zeman Alboros was the first president of the Commission of an enlarged European Union, but also an enlarged European Commission, 28 commissions. Bring all them together, not an easy task. Take the financial crisis. It hit uh, all of us, America and the European Union. It, uh, it created some particular problems for the European Union, for the euro area, for some countries inside the euro area. The person at the helm of the Commission has to address these issues, provide solutions, and again, keep people together. Take the Lisbon Treaty. We had three negative referenda before we were able to agree on a new, let's say, constitution of the European Union. Again, uh, the central stage was occupied by the President of the Commission. I think the Nobel Peace Prize in 2012 somehow symbolizes and si summarizes the importance of, of this uh, function. Uh, continue to ensure peace, stability, prosperity for uh, European Union, citizens around the 28 countries, half a billion people. So a very important job, certainly, but a very tough one. And I sometimes wonder if all the candidates that are now campaigning for this job, if they really knew how tough it is, would they still want to, to campaign for it and to take the job? Uh, but that's their problem, not, not mine. Second point, uh, in spite of his very young age, and he's only one year older than me, uh, is already one of the most senior leaders in Europe. Uh, some people don't know this, and he's very modest, or modest enough not to talk too much about it, but uh, he's the dean of the former G8, now G7. He's the dean of the European Council. As foreign minister, prime minister, and president of the commission, he's been in the European Council, which is the summit of European leaders, for altogether 15 years. 
He's also founder of the G20, was born here in Washington. I happen to be the Sherpa and we did it together. I was born here in Washington in late uh, uh, 2008. He's, he's the founder of that as well. And of course, in his function, he has traveled around the world. He has met numerous uh, leaders. Uh, given recent news, interesting to notice that he met uh, at least two times a year on a bilateral basis, if not three or four, including multilateral forum, uh, President Putin and President Medvedev in their different incarnations. So there's a lot of knowledge about this particular country and many other countries around the world. The third point is to say very clearly that uh, Germain Alvaroz is an Atlanticist. He's very keen about the role of NATO. He's very keen to promote cooperation between the EU and NATO. And of course, he's totally committed to the strengthening of transatlantic ties between the EU and the United States. I couldn't think of a better supporter for my activity in the last four years here. I don't think the Atlantic Council could think of a better advocate for Atlantic relations than uh, José Manuel Barroso. And um, I think I could say that he's a, an Atlanticist for all kinds of weather, including the today's tropical Brussels weather that you presented us with. Uh, he's been there all the time, in difficult and bad times, supporting transatlantic ties. And I think in the Atlantic Council, this is something I would like to stress particularly. So, as you've seen, I've developed a number of common views with Zeman Oberhoz. I think I've developed also a good friendship. Uh, and we share views on many things, with one exception, a very important one. We support different soccer teams in Portugal. <laughs> and my team has just won the Portuguese league. <laughs> so, as you can see, uh, at least in one area, Zeman Oberhoz can still do uh, better. <laughs> so it's my privilege and my honor and my pleasure to introduce you for a conversation with Fred Kemp, my very good friend, uh, José Manuel Barroso, the President of the European Commission. Ambassador, thank you so much for those introductory remarks. And uh, President Barroso, I think uh, uh, it wouldn't be right for me not to salute your ambassador, who is one of the most gifted uh, diplomats I've come across in my many years of dealing with uh, ambassadors and diplomats. So, so you're very lucky to have him here. Thank you very much. Uh, on behalf of uh, our chairman, uh, Governor Huntsman, uh, and all of the Atlantic Council, we want to welcome you most warmly, not only to the Atlantic Council for this very important conference toward a Europe whole and free, but we're also delighted that we'll be presenting you tonight uh, after an introduction by Governor Huntsman and also video introduction by Chancellor Merkel uh, with our Distinguished International uh, Leadership Award. Um, and uh, it's not the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, but, uh, uh, but we're proud to be able to honor you for your, for your service. Uh, as the ambassador said, it's a difficult time. I'll get to Ukraine. We had uh, 20, million hash uh, 20 million Twitter impressions yesterday, which is, for those who know Twitter, is a pretty remarkable thing. Uh, Twitter impressions are, seem insufficient um, tool in the face of what we're facing with the predatory Russia at the moment. Uh, on the other hand, it does underscore that so many leaders are using this conference as a platform to make significant statements and as a testament to our engaged followers. So uh, let me, before we get to Ukraine, which is I think what's really been driving the conversation yesterday, let me start with what this uh, conference is recognizing, which is the enlargements. And I'd like to get a feeling from you of what sort of impact you think the Ukraine crisis has on the EU already reduced appetite for enlargement. And what do you think the course ahead is there? Yeah. I'll do it immediately, but first of all, let me thank you for the invitation. Uh, let me thank you, Fred, for your kind remarks and also the very kind and friendly remarks of my friend, uh, João Valde Almeida. João Valde Almeida has been a great Sherpa for the G8 and G20. I've been my head of cabinet, a great head of cabinet, but I believe it's even a 
better uh, ambassador of the European Union to the United Nations, the United States. And so I really want to tell you how much we appreciate the good work he's been doing here uh, with you. Coming to your question, um, the Ukrainian uh, crisis, or let's say the Russia-Ukrainian crisis, uh, I think it's the biggest challenge to peace in Europe, at least since the um, fall of the Berlin Wall, if not even to, uh, after the, the Second World War. Of course, we had other difficult moments, namely the Bosnia uh, and the former Yugoslavia crisis. But in terms of um, the possible implications for a global peace, uh, this is certainly uh, the biggest challenge we are facing. And uh, why did it happen? It happened precisely because the European Union offered uh, Ukraine an association, and Russia did not accept it. That's the point. The Russian position was, uh, we have nothing against uh, uh, Ukraine even joining the European Union. That was what their official position. We don't want Ukraine to join NATO. But we have nothing against a closer association of Ukraine to the um, European Union. And we offered them at that time not membership, but an association agreement that includes a DCFTA, a deep and comprehensive free trade agreement. They have initialed the agreement. Different governments were very committed to it, including, by the way, former President Yanukovych. I spoke with him hours and hours and hours. Uh, as uh, Joel well just said, I mean, if there are leaders outside Europe that I've been speaking with are precise, I mean, the number one has been President Putin for more than 20 bilateral meetings. That's why it's really pity because, a pity because you have invested a lot in a relation with Russia. Now Russia is putting that in question, but also the Ukrainians. And they wanted to have the agreement. But at the last minute, or very close to the last minute, they did not sign the agreement they have initialed. And that provoked the upheaval of so many Ukrainians waving European flags by freezing temperatures in Kiev, and not only in Kiev, by the way. So this is the point. Uh, they were not um, allowed to choose their, their, their future by the Kremlin. This was exactly uh, what happened. And, now, did the, and, did, and why did this happen? Were you surprised because the, the line was drawn at NATO? And what this shows is that for Putin, he's expanded this no-go area to the European Union. What was behind that? Why did you think this um, happened? We are not completely surprised. Um, uh, in fact, we have been discussing this with uh, Putin himself for some time not before. Uh, President Putin has created the concept of the customs union and indeed the Eurasian Union. As you know, today, the customs union comprises of not only Russia, but Kazakhstan and Belarus. But he made no secret. In fact, he said it to us, myself and the President of the European Council, and sometimes bilateral to me, that his goal was basically Ukraine. That he wanted Ukraine to be part of that um, um, customs union and Eurasian union. Uh, we said we have nothing against uh, Ukraine having good relations with Russia. We understand that it's very important also for Ukraine to have good relations with Russia. And our position was not antagonistic regarding Russia. But we said that Ukraine has the right, if they so wish, to be associated with Europe, including by a free trade agreement. And that's when, in fact, the problems uh, started, because simply uh, Russia or the Russian leadership believes that uh, Ukraine has not the right to decide on their own future. Mm -hmm. And if you were looking back 2020 uh, self-criticism, uh, is there a way that the European Union could have handled this differently, or was this collision inevitable and really... It was the, yeah. unavoidable. Um, I, I find it sometimes interesting that we have this idea of criticizing ourselves when we're not doing the right things. Mm -hmm. I mean, someone who behaved not right was, of course, Russia. <laughs> yeah. They did not allow a country to decide on their own future. Look, um, Armenia, they decided not to go for it. The European Union has respected that. Yeah. And Ukraine really respected that. But it was the popular movement in Ukraine that was, in fact, uh, not accepting the, the, the diktat from Russia. 
The problem is indeed more profound. The problem is that uh, I would say intellectually and emotionally, the leadership in Russia and certainly President Putin, they have not accepted the independence of Ukraine. They believe, or at least President Putin believes, that Ukraine should be uh, part of Russia. And this is, of course, uh, uh, an important issue because uh, Russia recognized Ukraine. There was agreements, uh, international agreements, protecting, let's say, even the, the borders of Ukraine. There was agreements between Ukraine and Russia, for instance, regarding the uh, um, Russian bases in, in Crimea. So it's a very, very, let's say, hard violation of international law mm. that has to uh, uh, be resisted because also it sets in a terrible precedent uh, for, um, for global peace and order. Uh, if we accept the doctrine that now because of ethnicity or language, uh, we can change the borders. I mean, uh, Russia, I don't know, they have more than 80 uh, um, regions or, or um, ethnic groups. Uh, and so, and also, I mean, we cannot accept that. The idea that one country has the right to go inside others to protect those who speak its language. I mean, where are we going from here? So it's uh, indeed a very, a very serious challenge. And uh, I think uh, we, we, we have to understand what's going on uh, because uh, to some extent the Russia propaganda is very effective. They are trying to say Crimea is a special case and this was a special historic case. And there are always arguments for those who want to violate international law. But the question is if we stand or not by the respect of our values. Well, well let's talk about that. You call it unacceptable. Mm -hmm. uh, also, as Big Brzezinski yesterday said, it's the biggest test of the international system, echoing your words uh, since the end of the Cold War. But what do you do about it? If I look at the strengths of the European Union, uh, versus the strengths of Russia. This is an asymmetrical warfare situation, if you will. And to a certain extent, it looks as though the European Union and the United States are adopting a new approach, which is sanctions not as punishment, but almost as military deterrence. Uh, so you have had these many meetings with Vladimir Putin. What do you think is at the heart of what he's doing right now, and can he be dissuaded by these economic actions? I have no doubt that the goal of Mr. Putin is to have full control of Ukraine. I'm not saying that his goal is necessarily uh, to occupy all Ukraine. But to have full control of Ukraine, that's his goal, I have absolutely no doubts. In fact, he said it to me. Yeah. <laughs> he said several times that Ukraine was uh, an independent Ukraine was an artificial creation of the West. And so that's what uh, I think he believes. There are um, also probably emotional reasons for that regarding what he perceives as the, um, the worst moment in uh, the 21st century that was in fact the dismantling of the Soviet Union. There was also reasons of um, humiliation to be honest, probably not always uh, the West, or the f what we usually call the West, including the United States, have managed the Russia sensitivity as well. That's, I have to say honestly and objectively, uh, trying to be objective. Uh, but that is this goal. The goal is not Crimea. Crimea came as an accident in the strategic uh, objective that is to have control of this and in fact to rebuild the area of influence uh, around what was former Soviet Union. And of course, uh, with all respect for Russia, uh, Ukraine is much more important than Uzbekistan. The goal is Ukraine. Now, they started with Crimea. Now they are putting a lot of pressure in Eastern Ukraine, but the goal is Ukraine. That's why when uh, uh, almost Sovieticos like uh, Yanukovych but the normal Sovieticos that wanted to come closer to the European Union because he understood also that it was important for that country to be closer to the European Union and not to be under the influence of, of Russia, um, um, started to make these movements and then uh, yet to fail. 
And uh, now, of course, they will try to regain uh, control of the situation. So I think the best way to respond to Mr. Putin, first of all, is to make it clear that we can have an independent, sovereign, stable, democratic, and, and if possible, prosperous Ukraine. This is the best thing. That is best. After all, our sanctions are an instrument. They are, and they are not an enemy themselves, as you said. Right. Uh, our uh, um, uh, sanctions uh, are a way of trying to show the leadership in Russia that there will be serious consequences uh, if they continue this kind of behavior. But at least in the European Union, our goal is not to have a confrontation with Russia. We, we, why should we? Uh, Russia is an important country also for, for the European Union, and a country and civilization that we respect. What we do not agree with this kind of behavior. So we are trying to show the Russians that it's better for them, also in terms of the price they are going to pay, that they come to a negotiation mode, that there is a de-escalation, and that we can, of course, why not in one day, have Ukraine as a good, uh, um, a good example of cooperation between the European Union and Russia, and not, as today it is, a kind of a, um, a terrain for, for problems that risk to become global. Well, talk about that then. What is the goal of the sanctions? Is it the no negotiation mode? And then the second part of this, I really, I think it'd be very instructive for the audience for you to compare the EU, both attitude and real execution of sanctions and, and, and willingness to do more sanctions versus, uh, versus the US. What are the differences yeah. there? There, I want to be absolutely precise. First of all, we have been coordinating very closely with Americans and Europeans. I've been, for instance, in this G7 meeting. Now it's no longer G8, it's G7 uh, in The Hague with President Obama. And uh, uh, we are trying to make it as a general movement to show Russia that they have consequences. Much has been done already also by us. We have suspended, uh, we have canceled the negotiations for a new agreement that we are preparing with the, the Russians. We have uh, uh, suspended negotiations for a visa liberalization that was going on. Uh, we have canceled our bilateral summits. We have also excluded Russia, or Russia has excluded itself from the G8, and we are going to have the G8 meeting that was uh, supposed to take place in June in Sochi. It will be in Brussels as a G7 meeting. And we have also have stopped Russia's accession to the OECD. Regarding the target person, the, the sanctions to persons, we have already um, blocked um, 48 people that we deem responsible for recent events. Um, part of this is overlapping with what US has been doing. We have targeted a deputy prime minister, Kremlin advisors, heads of the Duma chambers, several members of parliament, and the top layer of the military system. So it can hardly be said that this was soft. But there is a difference with, between us and the United States, is that our legal basis um, is to tar allows us to target those responsible for to putting in question Ukraine's territorial integrity. And we need to be very careful so that um, we don't uh, have anyone challenging these decisions uh, in our legal system. The US has a more loose system targeting um, um, associations or people supporting the Russian government. Our target is those that have contributed directly to Ukrainian, um, um, to put in question Ukrainian territorial integrity. But we are standing ready to do more, as we have decided in the AIG summit of the G7. Um, and I read, uh, we said there, to intensify actions, including coordinated sectoral sanctions, that will have an increasingly significant impact on the Russian economy if Russia continues to escalate the situation. And that's now what we are considering. The European Commission was asked by the member states in the last European Council, our summit, to prepare a set of sanctions, uh, and we have been doing it. Uh, I will not go now in detail because I think it will be counterproductive, but uh, what I can tell you is that we have this ready, and we are now consulting uh, member states on this. Um, I can tell you that whatever we do, it will have a greater impact than what the United States uh, can do. Uh, for an important reason, we are European, uh, we are Russia's first trading partner. Yeah. Uh, the United States, I think it's the 28th trading partner of Russia. Our trade with Russia is 10 times more than the uh, trade of the United States. So even if lower in scale, uh, any measure taken by us has a much bigger impact on, on, on Russia. But even before those sectoral sa sanctions uh, can be adopted, 
Uh, it is important that already to note that already now they are having an important economic cost for Russia. Uh, $60 billion uh, in uh, uh, outflows of capital. Uh, investment decisions have been stopped. Uh, growth will fall uh, probably less than 1%, at probable recession. Today, the IMF said that they will have recession in Russia this year, and it's, uh, I mean, if they are considered as a growing, uh, uh, emerging economy as they are, they should be around six. That will be the ideal figure for their growth, the expectable figure. They are now at uh, a recession. And the credit rating agencies are also downgrading Russia's rating. And the 10-year uh, yield bonds are now from, went from seven to uh, nine. So this is the important point. Uh, we are doing a lot. I, I think it's uh, important to have this idea because sometimes I see in the media, as always, I mean, that's natural, yeah. uh, uh, kind of a, a, a competition between the United States and, and Europe. That's not the point. We are, that, that's, the point is not between us, the conflict between us and the United States. The problem is uh, the, the issues created by Russia and the need to have a strong uh, reaction to that, but a, a reaction that fulfills the purpose, and the purpose, I would say, yeah. is peace and not uh, to go for more difficult scenarios. I'm, I'm going to go to the audience in a second, but let me ask one um, follow-up on that. Um, Europe has much more at stake economically, so you can be hurt as well. You can shoot yourself in the foot through this. Uh, so it's understandable that Europe would be somewhat more reluctant. Can you talk about, you've been a master at managing the 28 in moments of crisis. What is it like right now? Your own country, if I'm not mistaken, gets none of its energy from Russia, while the Baltics, it may be 100% in, in yeah. this situation. So, so how do you manage wow. the, the, these, these diverse interests? And, and how do you actually implement sanctions that don't backfire yeah. against your, Europe's own growth yeah. and jobs? Yes, this is the issue, uh, in fact, and we have to be honest about it, of course. Uh, you have 28 independent countries in Europe. It's a union, but we have 28 sovereign states. And uh, so the impact of uh, any measure is felt uh, differently. Uh, just to give an example, we have four countries in Europe that uh, uh, are zero dependent on gas from Russia, including mine, Portugal, Spain, uh, Britain, and Ireland. We have six countries that are 100% dependent on gas from Russia. All the gas they receive is coming from Russia. And we have the, uh, all the others that are receiving between 50 to 80% of gas from Russia. That's why I've been working a lot on the issues of energy security. And uh, myself and the commission, we have by already se several years uh, promoting the idea of energy security. Unfortunately, uh, the decisions were not taken uh, by the member states as quickly as they should. Now there is, of course, a greater awareness of that but with concrete measures. For instance, just uh, on Monday, I was uh, in uh, Bratislava in Slovakia uh, as a witness to an agreement made by the company in uh, Slovakia and the company in Ukraine to have reverse flows, mm. a concrete example. And uh, uh, we have been now uh, promoting, for instance, LNG terminals. I believe, by the way, our agreement in the United States, uh, President Obama made very important remarks when he was recently in Brussels regarding the energy Mm -hmm. fact that we have been working also with our American partners and friends on this issue. So Europe is now developing a very important program of uh, energy security through, namely, diversification. I personally was involved in opening this southern corridor from Azerbaijan to, uh, to Europe. It will be the first time ever that we have uh, gas coming from the eastern part of uh, uh, from the east, uh, eastern side to Europe, that does not come from, from Russia, okay? Now, this is the way, is to precisely to avoid the different pain, uh, is to increase a real uh, 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 autonomy in terms of energy, to provide for energy supply, uh, um, and, uh, and to have a, a fully integrated internal market for energy. But uh, uh, that's why also in the package at European Union, uh, uh, will uh, define, if appropriate, now it's a decision of the member states. Um, I think uh, it's the burden has to be shared. But once again, I want to be clear, namely for those of you that do not know enough how the uh, European Union works, because they're very complex. Uh, I think it was Madeleine Albright who said once that uh, it's uh, only, uh, only a genius uh, or probably the French can understand the European Union. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, uh, it's quite difficult to understand. The Commission makes the proposals, yeah. but we don't decide. So in, term, in competition yeah. matters, the Commission decides. In, uh, uh, and in other matters, we have, let's say, the last say. 
But uh, uh, in these matters, what we can do and we are doing, requested by the member states, oh. is to present options. Yeah. And at the end, we have countries, I mean, and uh, from Germany to Britain, from France to, to Greece, from uh, Sweden to Cyprus, uh, I mean, from Estonia uh, to, to, to Spain deciding on this issue. So, yeah. And you can imagine it's a challenge. Having said this, let me tell you also very openly and frankly, that I think uh, in the last summit, I, of course, the President of the Commission is a member of the European Council. In the last summit, I saw a great degree of convergence among our member states. Our member states, even uh, in different positions, they understand that uh, uh, robust response has to be made because that's in our strategic interest. Of course, from a short-term point of view, it's true that some of these measures can have uh, difficulties. If you give a punch, mm. sometimes you get hurt in your wrist. Mm. Uh, but, but something has to be done if you want to be uh, credible and convincing. I would be remiss if we didn't mention Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, uh, bringing together the two largest economies on Earth, creating a platform that others could, could join, global standards. We think of it as a strategic act uh, here, but we're getting more worried at the Atlantic Council of support for this. How does the Ukraine crisis influence this? And how crucial, a, how do you, how crucial do, we, do you view TTIP? And are you a little bit concerned right now seeing some of the politics, both in the United States and, and, and Europe, turning yeah. in a somewhat negative direction? Even before the Ukrainian crisis, I was, in fact, a great supporter of this movement, uh, of this TTIP. And in fact, I was proud to announce it to, uh, in the margins of the G8 summit with President Obama because we have been working for some years to launch it. Uh, and one of the reasons, apart from the economic trade benefits that are clear, uh, is precisely uh, the, uh, let's say, the fact that it will be the biggest, not only the biggest ever uh, trade, bilateral trade and investment agreement, but also <coughs> made by democracies. Hmm. And I'm, I, I, I'm, I hope I'm not old fashioned when I'm saying I believe <laughs> open economies and open uh, systems are the best in the world. And there is a lot of talk, as you know, today about the other solutions that could appear more attractive. I don't believe that. I believe uh, open societies and open economies are more successful and more stable in the medium long run than apparent successes done through some kind of regulation, uh, authoritarian mode, regulatory, regulatory authoritarian mode. This is why I think it's important. Now, of course, this issue of Ukraine has put more pressure and more visibility on this. Mm -hmm. If we conclude this between the two biggest, uh, I mean, our two of the biggest economies in the world, European Union economy and American economy, I mean, it's a great message. Also, in terms of uh, uh, common standards, and including if, by the way, the rule but, of law. Because but if we don't, it shows even well, greater weakness. And, and that's and why I'm concerned, because to be honest with you, as always, in the open, I think it's important to note that there is uh, resistance. Yeah. There is a resistance, but because there is movement. So uh, every time you have movement, we have resistance. Uh, but also in the United States, from what I see, and also in some European quarters, there is some resistance. That's why I really hope that those who are Atlanticists, as you and myself we are, that we keep the issue very, very high in the agenda. Uh, and namely, the business community there has a great deal to, to uh, to, to do. I think it's very important that uh, we show to our respective public opinions why this transatlantic trade and investment partnership can have such a transformative role, not only for us, Europe and United States, but also for the global order, for the global community, because we could sta set standards that will be de facto uh, world standards. Thank you. Uh, let me take a couple of questions from the audience. We're running a little short on time, but please, please. Identify yourself, please, as well. Good morning, uh, Bato Kutelia, McCain Institute. I'm from Georgia. My question is uh, on uh, potential uh, contingencies of asymmetrical uh, reply from Russian Federation in terms of physical security of the energy infrastructure. What are the calculations or contingencies the European Union is making? Physical security of the energy infrastructure uh, in Ukraine. Question regarding that. In Ukraine, look. Not only. Not, not only. Okay. Yeah. 
Well, of course, no, no. Yeah. we are making, I mean, I'm not yeah. going out to make it public here, all the, the list of concerns we have. What I can tell you is that we have all those assessments made with all the scenarios considered. At the same time, and I want to make this point clear, not to be misunderstood, we are trying to work with Russia also on energy issues. You know that President Putin some time ago wrote a letter to uh, different countries in Europe, I think it was 18, and also some that are not in the European Union, but Europe, to which, with which they have relations in terms of gas. Telling those countries that because of the Ukrainian situation, there may be interruption of gas during the next months. And it was very interesting because all the member states of the European Union asked the Commission to reply on their behalf. So I wrote a letter to President Putin proposing to him to have trilateral meeting uh, by our uh, energy representatives from the Commission. It will be, um, it is uh, Commissioner Gunther Oettinger, the Commissioner for Energy, and for the Russian Federation, it is the uh, energy minister. They are going to meet, uh, it's in the next days, and um, precisely to try to solve those issues. So, and this is the point we have discussed earlier. <clears throat> At the same time, we want to take measures to show Russia that this has a price. I think it is both in our interest and in their interest as well to work constructively on energy issues because, let's put it frankly, I mean, it's true that some of our countries are dependent on gas, but Russia is also very much dependent on, on Europe because we are by far the biggest client and a very good client, I can tell you, that pays uh, in time uh, very important and big, big bills. So let's try to work to avoid the, the es escalation also in the field of energy. And that's why this, uh, this meeting is going to take place. And of course, we are going to look also at the ramifications in other countries, because other countries, I think we are thinking about Georgia, uh, Moldova, uh, other countries may be also affected. It's not just apart from, uh, for instance, there are, there are very serious implications also for Turkey, for Azerbaijan. So it is uh, an issue that is of extreme complexity and that you'd like, of course, to keep as much as possible um, dealt with some, let's say, constructive spirit. Questions? Uh, in the back. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, we've got one microphone. Sorry? Oh. oh. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Dmitry Zlodarev. I'm a journalist from Peter Tass Newswire Service of Russia. And my question is, what conditions should be created for the next round of uh, European sanctions? In what conditions you will, you will make uh, the next decision? Thank you. So what would set off your next round of sanctions? What, what would have to happen for the next round of sanctions to be implemented? Uh, just now, I mean, uh, Recently, the foreign affairs ministers have decided on a new, um, let's say, uh, group of, uh, of um, targets, including also the restrictions to some individuals. And now, as I've told you, we are discussing this with member states. Um, I don't think it's useful now, and it will be wise to say when we are going for the next step. We are already discussing this between uh, ourselves. Just yesterday, I, had a, I can tell you, I had a meeting with, with uh, Chancellor Merkel in, uh, in Berlin, and we are discussing also this with our, all our partners uh, in the European Union. And certainly, Mrs. Merkel, tomorrow she's going to meet President Obama here in Washington. They will, of course, address the issue. So we are discussing the issue. We will see when it is appropriate. Of course, our... Um, uh, um, concern in Europe, and my personal concern is that uh, the European Union remains coherent in its approach. Uh, I think it's better uh, to, to have a common position uh, uh, from all member states of the European Union. 
Uh, and of course, as I've said to you before earlier, it's only natural uh, that because of different uh, um, positions, uh, some see as priority some kind of sanctions, others could see other. And this is what I can tell you at this moment. Uh, we only have three, four minutes left, so I'm going to hit on two subjects I think we should hit on. Uh, but, uh, uh, but I know they, they take some lengthy explanation, but let, let's see if we can deal with them. The first is really the elections that are coming up, and are you worried about the emergence of uh, anti-European extremists left and right uh, coming to the fore and, and the state of European democracy? The second part uh, is the question at the front end, when can we expect the next European enlargement? Hmm. First of all, uh, I can start by the last. Um, when I assumed my current position in 2004, it almost coincided uh, with the biggest enlargement ever, so uh, 10 more countries. So uh, that, that before we had, uh, uh, I don't remember, 15 countries. Mm -hmm. And now we have 28, because we had these 10 countries that we are now commemorating the accession, afterwards Bulgaria and Romania, and most recently Croatia, okay? And we are now actively negotiating with others, namely uh, in the um, Balkans. So I think the process of enlargement is going on because it has been a great success for Europe, not only for those countries. I mean, um, just as we are speaking about Ukraine, uh, some years before the accession to the European Union, Poland and Ukraine had more or less the same GDP per capita. Now, the GDP per capita of Poland is three times higher. So the transformative power of the European Union is something extremely important. Of course, it was important to have NATO, but it's not by accident that all those countries that got rid of communist totalitarianism wanted to join the European Union. All of them wanted to join and they are asking to become uh, members, those who have not yet become members. So I believe we should keep the enlargement. Of course, it is true that uh, today the public opinion in Europe is more, more prudent in that matter. We have to be sure that the countries are ready to become part of the European Union and that also the European Union is ready to incorporate them. But I believe, namely with the, Balti the, sorry, with the uh, Balkan countries, that there will be not a big, a big difficulty because they are relatively small, so uh, we can do that. Now, the other, the f first question was? European democracy in the elections. Uh, European democracy. Now, of course, it's normal. The, the extremists are going up, mainly from the extreme right, but also from the extreme left. It's normal in times of crisis because of the high levels of unemployment. Uh, but I believe that by and large, the so-called mainstream forces from the center left to center right, those that are pro-European, will remain largely, largely dominant in the next European Parliament. But of course, we have to be attentive to this, because today what happens in Europe is the following. There are different movement, moment, movements. Some of them are with an anti-European agenda, but in fact, their motivation is anti-migrants. Mm -hmm. There are a survey of public opinion points that show that the that the anti-European part in Britain, UKIP, the most important motive for the vote is against foreigners. And one thing that is in common between all those movements, some traditional Eurosceptics, some Europhobes, some anti-migration, some xenophobic, some even racist and extreme right, like we are seeing also in some countries. There is one thing in common, some protectionist. Mm -hmm. Protection. One thing they have in common is the following. They are all against the European Union. That's another reason to defend the European Union. <laughs> and that's why I believe the European Union is something very important for us in Europe, and I will dare say also for you in the United States as a good and loyal partner to the United States of America. Well, thank, thank you very much, President Bro. So let me uh, close by, by thanking you for taking your time with us this morning, thanking you for letting us honor you this evening. I hope many of you will be there th t tonight. Uh, uh, you know by the honor we're giving this evening how we feel about the future of the European Union and your role in it. So join me in applauding President Barroso. Thank you.